how do you then go about, because you're building this sort of online resume in a sense, because people can come in, they can view your stuff for free, mm -hmm. you know, you have a website, right? Yeah. yeah, so you have a website, like a YouTube channel, social media. We can talk on Twitter a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. Do you wind up selling music or do you wind up selling, because I know you're making t-shirts and art, mm -hmm. sort of like to go with the music. So there's like an audiovisual uh, component. Do, do you wind up like as a band? What I'm trying to figure yeah. out is... How do I make money? Yeah, like we, we talked before, um, I'm a big fan of uh, Fish and the Grateful Dead. And yeah. the Grateful Dead, and before the internet, introduced what I think is essentially like a sort of pre-internet viral marketing where yeah. fans were taping the shows, trading yeah. the tapes, and you created this community of people yeah. where everybody else hated the Grateful Dead, but the 1% of the population that loved the Grateful Dead was so fanatic and would buy everything the band put out, would yeah. go on to or travel with them, that they built their brand sort of around that. Yeah. Well, in, in the internet age, things have slightly shifted, but I've noticed that bands like Fish, I haven't followed them much in the past 10 years because I've been so busy working on my own business. You know, they sell stickers, they sell t-shirts, they sell... Um, I think now if you buy a ticket to the show, um, now what the band does, instead of having people just tape and trade their shows, you can actually buy the recording. But I think what they're doing is, let's say you pay $40 for the ticket for the show, you go see the show, when you come home, whenever that goes up, there's a ticket number that you can download the show yeah. you just got. So you have this pleasant memory of this in-person experience. So a band like Fish, who was around when Napster hit and the music industry shifted, they're still making millions upon millions of dollars because they created this loyal fan base that would buy anything they would purchase and they never really made the bulk of their income off of recordings to begin with or albums. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a, a distinct realization because as I was producing, you know, workbooks and, and videos, this was the first time I ever created something because I had a service, like yeah. a concert. And as I created these, I realized those were my albums. Yeah. People kept thinking, well, this is, you know, what Robert does. Yeah. But every time I put one of these out, I'd already surpassed it. I'd already gotten tired of the songs that were on that recording and had moved on to yeah. something else. And that degree of improvisation within their music was part of the thing that hardcore fans wanted. Yeah, that's what brings people back. They wanted to see... It's, we're growing. Okay, we're so growing. is that part of the thing that Gary Vee is talking about with the document? I think so. Document, don't create. Just yeah. document what you're doing. Yeah, I think another big part of the documenting is that uh, people learn from greatly from experience. So if they're watching you document your experience of growth, whatever that might be, uh, they're somewhat experiencing it with you um, by watching it. So it's a great way to learn. It, a great way to learn is to watch somebody else learn. You learn right along with them. Um, so, I mean, and you connect with them once again. Uh, I think it's a great way to go. So what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to ask now is when it comes to music, is in this day and age, because it's not my industry, how are people selling music? And uh, how has it changed because of the internet? Okay, uh, they're not selling it a lot. The sales are down, but in some ways. Uh, like, there, there's not as... So not, there, there's they, not as much like selling of an album. Yeah, it, basically, it's it's not that they're even that the sales are down. It's that it's not as big of a percentage of where profits come from. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> there's so many things that you can do with merchandise, and plus, like me, I mean, I'm interested in clothes. I'm interested in art. I'm interested in all these other things. I, it's, I'm not just a musician. So uh, like. Merch is a big part part of it, you know, the, the shirts, the leggings, the, the prints, the, all that stuff. Uh, and you can't pirate that stuff, that's, you know, physical it's stuff. Yeah. yeah, and you asked about, you know, the, the resume, you know, what's the use of the resume is, uh, so when a band wants to perform somewhere, if they want to book a festival, they can send those videos in and that is much, gets them much more likely to be booked exposure. for that festival. Yes, from the exposure. Yeah, sort of and, 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 you know, shows are paid, um, you know, people, the, the viewers pay for, for the, tickets. For the live you know. experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
that's that's a big part of where it comes from. I mean, from. I, mean I remember years ago, life. you know, the, the video camera we're using today is much better than the one I had years ago. But I produced a series of videos about a mod roller, this kind of wooden dowel, some massage tool. And a guy from Boston uh, purchased one and was using it from the YouTube videos I produced. And he was lamenting the fact that I didn't live in Boston to give him a session because I helped him so much online with a free YouTube video. His comment was, I can't imagine what you could do if you could actually, you know, put your hands on me. And my only thought was, why hadn't a massage therapist in Boston created a video that the guy found before he found mine? Like, I'm a guy, I was working on my garage with a flip cam, no less. Like, it was a little hundred dollar thing that's probably not as good as my smartphone is now. Yeah. And recently a guy from California contacted me, I live here in Round Rock or outside of Austin, and he's gonna, he's gonna be in Austin in October, and he wanted to schedule an appointment with me. Uh, what? Like, yeah. the thing is, my schedule isn't even completely full just from people in Austin. Not completely booked out, like I'm not booked out a year. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, a guy is coming in from California to pay me money to give him a session, but I never could have made contact with him previously if I hadn't put out free content. Yeah. So it's really hard for me to, to figure out the trajectory. Like with your industry, specifically with music, I find it interesting because it's not one that I'm in. And I find more information flow, uh, more innovative ideas outside of the massage industry because I feel like the massage industry is still being operated like it's 1985. It's not operating like it's 2016 because massage therapists, frankly, aren't putting out a great number of videos like the ones you and I are yeah. sharing and right, filming right yeah. now. Yeah, and in terms of music, it's still a small percentage of musicians are up to date. And I mean, you asked, you know, why didn't somebody in Boston already have made that thing, that video? Uh, it's, honestly, it's because this is all just so new. And uh, I, we're, I think we're slow to adapt. Uh, it, it's, it's weird because we've got cell phones now. We've all got cell phones. And all this tech is right at our fingertips that to, to you know, to... Uh, to soak it up and, and, you know, we can flip through Instagram, through Twitter or whatever to look at what's there. And uh, it's so obvious to us to experience it. But I think it takes a little bit longer maybe for some people to realize, oh, I can do this stuff. Because it, there's, there's a separation in a lot of time. A lot of times there's a separation between uh, creation and observation. Things like Instagram and Twitter are breaking those down because, you know, we make stuff for it. Well, the, the production, um, people think of themselves as consumers and not producers. But almost as soon as I started to produce content, you started to have a way of self-reflecting because you could see what you were producing and you could see people's response. Oh, I'm so, so much better since I started so, making So you started. had a chance to start thinking about it from the consumer's perspective because you just shifted from being a guy who watches videos yeah. to production. And when you shifted to production, you got a chance to respond to what, what do people want? Yeah. What, what do people respond and what to? what do I want? What do, they, what do they comment on? What do they, you know, do they subscribe? Do they leave yeah. comments? Do they ask questions? When I talk on Facebook groups that I run, or I, like I tweeted out today, hey, if you got any massage or business questions, let me know. And after I shoot this video, I'll check my smartphone just to see if anybody has a question. The rapport that I just made with that massage therapist who lives in the Midwest who asks me a question related to business that I can then very quickly make him a YouTube video and respond, that guy's going to subscribe to my channel. Yeah. And what I don't know is, what, what does that do You know, a year from now, five years from now, yeah. ten years from now, as the technology becomes even more pervasive? I, I you know kicking and screaming and trying to drag the massage therapist onto Snapchat and other social media. And I keep getting massage therapists asking me, well, how do I get clients using Snapchat? And the thing is, it's almost like I don't have an allegiance to Snapchat specifically. What I have an allegiance to is the fact that the technology is going to continue to evolve and I have to understand how to use it so that I can grab hold of the next thing. Yeah, how long have thing. we had the internet for? How many years? I, I don't know. I mean, I first, it, I first really started... 30, less? I, yeah, I, I first I, started really using the internet in 1995 or 6. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's like no time at all. Yeah. So, we just started, 
And and what we have now is fun. I mean, who knows what it's going to be in 20 years. Uh, I, I don't know why you wouldn't want to jump on that and start playing with it. Well, because the thing is, in my industry, here's the thing. Like, would you give away massage for free? Would you give away music for free? I mean, I do. And, but see, that's the thing. Um, People are saying, they're like, why would I... Uh, produce free content when I can produce paid content. Why wouldn't I just produce more of this? And I mean, I'll continue to produce this. Yeah. This is fine. I don't have a problem producing workbooks and videos. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do make retail sales on workbooks and videos. But it always feels to me like the sales of these workbooks and videos builds on top of the free content. Because if I don't give them the free content, it doesn't matter that I have a hundred of these for sale. Mm -hmm. They don't know who I am. They, they yeah. can't get started. The fact that you and I can sit and have this conversation and build a relationship with the audience means that they're more likely to buy. Mm -hmm. But there's still that question. So for instance, if I teach people at Time Massage Jam how to do time massage, and I give it away freely, there are people who essentially are arguing that it diminishes the value of time massage. Not at all. Not at all. But you can get time massage for like five or 10 bucks. Yeah, it, it doesn't though. Um, and and the, so, but if people can go to the time massage gym and get time massage for five or ten bucks, why are they going to come to me and pay me two hundred dollars a session? Because now they know you're worth it. <laughs> I feel like I should play devil's advocate. It it just it these ideas to me are perplexing because the thing is, um, one of the things I don't like, for instance, is I don't like free chair massage. There's multiple reasons I don't like that. One, I don't like to give away free body. Now, I'm going to clarify that, what that means. I don't like setting up a massage chair and giving away free chair massage. I don't like massage chairs. I don't think it's as effective as doing like mat-based work where the person is also clothed. Time massage jam became, in my industry, my free chair massage. But the difference was, I felt like Tom Sawyer because what I was doing was whitewashing the fence and saying, wow, this is so much fun, everybody wanted to help yeah. me whitewash the fence. And it's a more honest representation of what you do. How so? Like, like chair massage isn't, yeah. is, it, it's, it's not as effective. Yeah. So it's not fully communicating the health benefits and you know what it can do for yourself. Well, it didn't allow me. And the thing is, it's not that chair massage isn't effective. It's that for a, okay. from a marketing standpoint, I mean, chair massage is good. Yeah. It's just that I personally don't like the body body mechanics of working on a chair. Gotcha. Okay. That's my own personal preference. Yeah. And also, I did a form of work that was clothed on a mat, and I kept saying, well, why not just work on people on a mat? And if I worked on people on a mat, here's what happened. They went, that, that's weird. People kind of like, well, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Because in, in our culture, massage is done on a table clothes. So the yeah. thing is, the innovation, the crazy wild innovation, was to take something from a Thai culture yeah. and say, this is American now. Thai massage jam is American. Yeah. Thai massage jam, this is an event. This is a community bodywork event where I show you how to work on people, and guess what happens? You go and work on people. They like your work so much. They know that you're friends of me and you learn from me. And then who do they want to get a session with? And that's the create. That's the, the thing people don't understand. I've been trying over the years to promote Time Massage Jam. Massage therapists don't even understand what it is yet because it breaks the rules because massage therapists think, okay, there's a client-therapist relationship and there is a teacher-student relationship. So these two, two categories. Because I'm not giving a massage for a fee, and I'm not teaching a class that was this crazy third category. That no, everybody's like, wait, we don't, we don't know how to package this. We don't know what this is. And I'm like, I'll take care of that for you. But the sorts of connections that form, that relationship that built meant that we could build the Austin Time Massage Group to the point where it's almost got a thousand members. I think it's a little over 700 right now. And that's just in my city. Well, what happened is that became advertising. That became making noise, building relationships in the same way you're talking about uh, social media, the same way you're talking about YouTube videos. It's just interesting to me to see how the technology is interacting with the industries to change where does revenue actually come from? Yeah. What do we put value on? Because it, the music industry used to be you buy albums. Yeah. You buy a record. You buy a product. 
And I think more of the income came out of that, and then now has it just shifted towards a concert, a ticket? The profits? Yeah. Uh, Re revenue, actual money. Yeah. Tickets and merch are the two biggest money makers. Because you had like albums, and then I guess albums are sort of like merch. So you have albums, kind of tickets and merch. Yeah. But then as albums decreased, they started to focus more on the others. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and if, if you think about it, like albums were an anomaly from the, from the get go. Uh, because uh, what happened is, you know, in the 60s, technology developed. There was a small jump in technology at that time that allowed us to, you know, create. Uh, records and stuff the way we did then, and 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 then you know we we got we got tapes and we got CDs and, and you know different other ways of presenting albums, and but if you go past the sixties, you know a little bit earlier when we didn't have those things, how did people pay for music? They went to the show, you know. I mean the the the, the whole idea of an album was you know it's very short lived. Yeah. Um, we're just going back, uh, we're taking all our technology and integrating it better into our society so that, you know, our smartphones are just like normal to us and uh, us collecting that music, it's normal to us. So we're kind of in a way going back to the original of, oh, the really cool thing is to go see the show um, and to experience now, now it's now it's better because you can experience us building the show, the documentation that we were talking about earlier. You mean and building part. a fan base because you're yeah. documenting the yeah. process. So of making it's, an album it's and the experience has gotten better as as time has passed. The the thing that I've noticed about uh, Snapchat in particular, when people talk to me about it, is Snapchat feels like it's behind the scenes. When uh, Gary V puts out a YouTube video that has a certain degree of Hollywood, it's put out. Um, then I see a post on Instagram. When I see Gary V Snapchat, it feels there's something interesting about it psychologically. It feels like Gary V got on his Snapchat and just sent me a message. It, it's different. YouTube yeah. feels like it's to everybody. Instagram, maybe to a degree, the same. Mm -hmm. Um, there's something about Snapchat in particular where it just feels like Gary's having a conversation with me. Yeah. And it, it was it was amazing to me to initially uh, notice that when I was using yeah. it because I was learning how to use Snapchat and how it functioned. And as a massage therapist, I kept thinking, well, how do you use this with clients? And then a massage therapist was telling me that he was following up with his clients. So I'd give you a session. The next day, if you were on Snapchat, I could Snapchat you and say, hey, Josh, just want to check in, see how you're doing, see how you feel. You know, remember to drink some water today? Just Snapchat me back, let me know how you're doing. And I was like, this is genius. It's absolutely genius because you're just using the technology and what it allows, but here's the thing. If I had sent that via email, it's like, ah, you might not check your email. The other thing is it just feels personal. Yeah, we have to use whatever feels personal to the society at the time. And the thing is, in my business at least, because I press the flesh, I have one of the most personal and intimate jobs ever. Yeah. And the thing is, increasing that intimate connection is actually what clients want. So right now, not a ton of my clients, not all of them, particularly are on Snapchat, but over the years, that will probably shift and change. Yeah, sure. And then if you're not interacting with your clients that way, I think you could actually see a reflection in your sales because yeah. you're taking advantage of what the technology does allow. One of the things that completely shifted my entire practice was reading the books of Ray Kurzweil. And Ray Kurzweil talks about the singularity. He speculates about uh, technology, technology and technological shift and artificial intelligence and what it's going to do to us as a species, as a culture. And what Ray Kurzweil did was he saved me from being a Luddite because I didn't like what I saw where people felt disconnected from the land. They weren't gardening. They didn't know where the food came from. They sort of almost hit the ideal, this idyllic, you know, we're no longer farmers. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that perspective, but when I really thought about it after reading Kurzweil's books, I realized that I learned how to garden organically because I read about it on the internet. And I watched videos on the internet and YouTube. And I went, you learned about vermiculture and, and like using worm yeah. compost, you know, to grow plants because you read it on the internet. Yeah. 
you 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 preserved like what's considered like archaic technology for organic gardening that would have been passed down from generation to generation because there was a disruption because of the technology people moved away from the land but it was preserved yeah. and it was partially preserved by the internet that process of not being a Luddite, um, I don't know if like in music, music, for instance, like when the Moog synth came out, how many, you know, how many musicians, piano players saw the Moog and was like, that's not music. Oh yeah, tons. Because it's like, you know, electric guitar, ah, that's not blues, that's yeah. crap, you know, yeah. that's a bunch of... That's not real music. Yeah. That's happened, that happens every time something new happens. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody goes, that's not real. Yeah, or it's like, that's not... <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's amazing uh, how there's always this concern that this new thing is going to destroy the old thing. And yes, sometimes stuff dies out. That, that definitely happens all the time, that things die out. But over and over again, you see when there's more stuff in the world, things usually work out better. Yeah. Um, like, you know, you, you learn how to garden on the internet. Yeah. I, I was just thinking when you were talking about, uh, you know, people adding more products and things, you know, ruining competition and all of that, is I, I was just thinking, I, I mean, I don't have the numbers, I don't know, but I, I wonder, like, when, when it became easier to buy nail polish, did that kill nail salons? Maybe a couple. But I doubt it killed the industry. I bet it made the industry grow exponentially. When you, when it's easier to get hair products, so you like, stop so, going so in other words, it's to like, get your hair cut. Ah, okay. So you the know, thing is, it's, it's going to make the it's transformation going to add more is creating people. a new industry. Yeah, and and yes, some things will die out, but the sum total is higher because so let's take hair products. When there's more hair products. There's more people reading about hair products. That means there's more people whose interests are getting piqued about hair products, which means there's more people that start to be interested in hair, period. So overall, things grow. Yeah. So I, it's, just, it's so positive just when, you know, you add things to the world, good things happen. So is, it, is the innovation in creating a new industry? Sometimes. Is that, is that really what it is? In other words, um, when Hendrix came along, and not that Hendrix created electric blues, but um, Hendrix, but historically, yeah, yeah, Hendrix sure. historically, you know, created a new sort of way of playing a guitar, something yeah. that stands out when you look through the history of music. Yeah. You know, he, he innovated the playing of the guitar. You know, he died while he was young. I think he was 27. So he left this indelible mark because the artistry and the technology converged at this single point that yeah. became, you know, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. When it could be recorded yeah. and preserved for posterity. Yeah, it, it built the world in a huge, magical way. And in, in the sense, so for instance, I guess what I'm then getting at is um, Electric Mud. I've heard people talk about the album Electric Mud saying that Muddy Waters... It's not a Muddy Waters album. Muddy Waters is blues. And that blues was not electric. Electric Mud is taking Muddy Waters' you know, voice and putting it on top of these Dude, electric it's... instruments. People change. Music yeah. changes. I mean, uh, the music that I make right now, I'm not yeah. going to make in 20 years. Yeah. Enjoy it while it lasts. Ah. Well, I mean, a, a <laughs> and, mine... and because of our technology, it'll still be here in 20 years. Yeah. I, my stuff that I make now is still going to be so available available. To me. Yeah. but I'm going to change and Bowie uh, David Bowie you know he's very well known and respected for exactly that was his evolution as an artist uh, I saw multiple interviews of uh, Trent Reznor with Nine Inch Nails talking about Bowie and how much he respected Bowie because when Trent Reznor went on tour with Bowie uh Bowie talked to Trent, Trent Reznor and was like, you know, they're going to be actually more about your music. They're going to be more excited about your music because I'm not going to play my famous songs. I'm not going to, I mean, maybe some of them, but he, he was like, I'm not going to play my biggest stuff. I'm going to play my new stuff because that's what I'm into. And that made Trent Reznor, like, you know, really think. He's like, wow, this is, you know, this is what a, a real artist does. This is yeah. what you can do. Is you can evolve. 
Uh, and David Bowie did that all the time. Was he evolved? See, well, here's, but here's the thing. Um, like a friend of mine, Josh Eggenberger, uh, lives in Lafayette. We, we knew each other years ago when I was at LSU. And he played a guitar and then started playing banjo. Now, we had a pretty broad musical range, and he was a musician. He's a wonderful, uh, wonderfully gifted musician. And he contacted me recently because he's playing banjo, but he's playing banjo now in a cover band that does uh, bluegrass versions of Iron Maiden songs. <laughs> and it was like Iron Maiden or Iron Mountain, or I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'll, I'll make sure there's a link to his stuff. And I, I just laughed because I was like, okay, I don't really know the music of Iron Maiden. Mm -hmm. I, I was never been a big fan, I know, of them. Mm -hmm. But I was immediately piqued because I like bluegrass music and I like Josh. I have a relationship with him. So it made me interested in, well, what is this going on? And I kept wondering, how many people came to that show in Austin because they were bluegrass fans? And how many became you know, Iron Maiden fans, and then what happens when those two communities intertwine? Yeah. yeah, all the time I play songs for my, just for my friends. I'm like, you know, some, some song that they never would have listened to in the first place. Yeah. And they tell me, oh, because you played that for me, I'm into that song now, or I'm into, <laughs> or I'm into that artist now. Yeah. Because uh, there's the, especially with music, as a listener, a lot of us are aren't super educated. We even if we experience a whole lot of music, we don't always know why we like something and why we don't. Um, a lot of us do, but uh, a lot of us just go, "Ooh, that's cool." And when that happens, if we don't know why we like something, if we don't like at the very base level, then a lot of times we can be distracted from something that's really good by some little production change. Like say, for example, you're a person that normally doesn't like loud distorted electric guitar. There could be an amazing song written that has a loud distorted electric guitar on it, but because your ear heard the loud distorted electric guitar first, suddenly you just click off and go, oh, I don't like that song. But then you hear somebody play it without a loud distorted yeah. electric guitar, and they go, wait a second, that song is amazing. Let me go back and listen to the original, too. And suddenly they like the original, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the String Cheese Incident was a band I listened to a lot in college. And again, there's been that 10-year gap because I was so busy building my business that some of my hobbies kind of fell by the wayside. But one of the things about them was they helped introduce me even more so to bluegrass, but they did so in electric context. But when I was done listening to them, it made complete sense to listen to Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. It made complete sense to listen to Vassar Clemens. It, it, it made the music make sense in the same way that Jimi Hendrix turned me on to blues music. That didn't quite make sense to me contextually. Because I grew up in the age of Nirvana. You know, Nirvana hit when I was in middle school and through high school. So that was what I was used to. That was the musical tradition, I guess, that was thrust upon me from MTV. But having, you know, electric versions, does it destroy bluegrass and old-time music? No. Are bluegrass festivals dead now because that music is dying? No, they are not dead. And see, <laughs> there's this weird, like, niche, like, subculture. Yeah. And that's what I find so interesting is, like, does it add just diversity to the marketplace? So... For instance, if I teach Thai massage at Thai Massage Jam, people are worried that it somehow devalues the work. And I go, listen, you know, how many chefs spend their time producing YouTube videos convincing you to never cook your own food? <laughs> don't, don't go to a restaurant. You know, or don't, don't learn how to cook your own food is what I'm saying. And it's yeah. like, it's, why is that funny? But it's like if you teach people massage, they're like, that's why there's all these unlicensed practitioners. And it's like, no. They're unlicensed practitioners because the state massage board doesn't crack down on it. It doesn't have anything to do with people knowing how to do massage. Other massage channels put up videos constantly where people can learn how to do massage for free on YouTube. If you want to. You know, I mean, the thing is, I want to learn, I want to learn uh, straw bale construction. I I've never looked it up on YouTube. I guarantee you I can find I think a, I have. a million channels <laughs> and they will show me for free on YouTube how to yes. deal with, like, straw bale construction. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I mean it's, it's like this, but it's this weird niche thing, yeah. right? Like, 
And it's, and it's like, well, why would you build a house this way and not that way? Well, there are advantages and disadvantages. You know, why does a chef decide to focus on a particular kind of cuisine and work in a restaurant? Because he knows that you're never going to spend the time at home to reduce the uh, chemistry elements for these five different components to make this, you know, cord on your tongue. You're never, most home cooks are never going to spend that much time because at a certain point, the food that we get nutrition from, if you push it far, it becomes art. And when it becomes art, what's it worth? Because the chef, like if you take some of the best restaurants in the world, um, I've seen some various uh, shows on Netflix about this recently. Uh, I think the, the chef's table was one of them. They profile, yeah, they profile different you know, restaurants. And some of these places that are you know, gastronomic, height. I mean, they are the, the end-all, be-all of gastronomy and food chemistry. Gastronomical. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of a word, but I mean, it fails me. <laughs> <laughs> but, they're, but they're creating art. They're, they're pushing food even further. And the thing is, that's not going to happen for me at home. I mean, I can take pieces and components and elements and aspire to greater heights, but I'm not going to be able to do what those food chemists are able to do. There's always a place for specialists. Yeah. There's always a place for people that are willing to master something because we value that. We value mastery. Um, and chefs, they master stuff. See, I, it's, it's so interesting to me because uh, food trucks. Food trucks are really a, a big deal. In now, now you're making me happy. Oh, you like food trucks? I love food trucks. Yeah, see, and who doesn't like food trucks? But when law and regulation means you can't have a food truck, what it does is it forces a cook who might have the skill to try to go do something else because the overhead on a restaurant is so high to have a physical building, it helps you cut the cost and put more money into food. So it creates more diversity in the marketplace. It's kind of like passing laws against busking because, well, no, we have a concert in this venue and this guy's got people out on the street and you're you're breaking the rules, which a little bit is what Time and Size Jam falls into. Is people are, are basically saying, listen, we understand what you're doing is illegal, but you're breaking the rules. You're breaking the societal convention that we've had established for this long period of time. And I go, why? And I go, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it does pique my interest. You know, how do you, as a business... How do you make money and how do you manipulate those angles to make profit, to be able to create the art that you want and to create the business that you want? Because if you can't afford your rent and you can't afford to have a car, you can't, have a, you can't afford to have the basics that we need in America to survive, you can't really create that art. And that's the real question is as a massage therapist, how do you make enough money to do something different. Once I got into complete private practice, everything started to shift in, in a much uh, greater way because it felt like if you set Picasso loose instead of having to produce art that somebody else had already um, paid for in advance. I want a mural of Picasso and he had to create that. When you just set him free to create whatever he wanted, that space as a body worker helped me develop Reboot in something that was completely different. Because it didn't look like massage anymore. I think it accomplished what people wanted for a massage in a much more effective way, in a much more transformative way. But it didn't look like massage. Massage is done on a table, it's done with a person naked, it involves creamy line. And I said, no, I'm going to work on a person on a mat clothed. And the sessions are three hours long. The people, they don't even know what to do with that. But much like the Grateful Dead, I don't care that 90% of the population doesn't want it. Or 90% of the population doesn't, doesn't even know what it is. Yeah. Long term, it's about having enough clients to fill my books, to pay my mortgage, to be able to buy a camera, to be able to hire you, and to keep growing. People wonder, how did I do this? Well, I did it out of my blood, sweat, and tears because I kept following that inner voice as an artist. And as much as I want other people to do that, that's why we produce, I produce this content, is I want to inspire people to greater heights in their business. Yeah. But it's because I'm trying to get them to follow their heart and actually go after what their dreams are. 
because there's so much pressure. Uh, my first thought is high school. And then when I think about high school, the first thing I can think of, bringing it back to music, is the wall. Is the running them through the sausage machine. You know, you know what I'm saying? To homogenize yes. it all. Yeah. Because the, the, the educational process, if you're not careful, it stamps out all creativity. Yeah. But how do you make money? How do you, yeah, and, you know, create art? How do you, as a massage therapist, how do you do what you want to do and make a real living? And my answer to that is to put out free content and to not look like everybody else. Yeah. And in simple form. It doesn't sound like the answer at first, but it is. The, there's a complexity because what I, I can't tell, let's say you are a massage therapist, I can't tell you always in business exactly what to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you advice based on my experience and hope that like uh, when you cook spaghetti and it's ready and you make it stick to the wall, that's what it's done. It's that sort of thing. I'm just throwing a bunch of stuff at you and seeing what sticks. Yeah. Because your skill set for communication, for video production, for website development, for social media use, uh, body work, is all different. Yeah. Your skill sets are different. It's trying to get massage therapists to actually utilize the resources available to them. Don't forget to subscribe, yo!